journeys tend to need to be quite unique and specific to the category that you're operating in, even down to the brand that you're operating in. But um, I do a lot of work with FMCG brands. I do a lot of work with, with Unilever, the, the global FMCG. And this is the type of model that we use for, for Unilever. And quite simply, it says um, people, before they even come into market and are ready to buy a product, will have a set of associations about the brand or about the category. So this might be something along the lines of Hellman's mayonnaise, mayonnaise brand, um, global may mayonnaise brand, makes really, really tasty burgers. So that's your mental association, it's a set of memory structures. Then something will trigger that, those associations, so that will be a need. So all of a sudden, I know that Hellman's makes great tasting burgers, but it's now 32 degrees, I'm going to fire up the barbecue, I'm going to have a party in my garden. So I need to, bring, I need to buy some mayonnaise um, to start cooking with. That triggering of the need will then turn into an action. So that action might be I'm taking my jar of mayonnaise out of the fridge, or I'm going to buy, buy it. Um, and then finally, when you use the product, that becomes an experience. And the experience of that product then feeds all the way back into rebuilding that association. Yeah, so that's the kind of cyclical journey that, that, that consumers go through. Now we're going to see two shifts driven by this big theme of merge on the consumer journey. So the first is that we're going to see a closing of the gap between this trigger stage, so the triggering of the need, and the action stage. So these two are just going to get closer and closer and closer when technology finds ways of better meeting consumer needs. Yeah? So commerce, which is really what happens around here, is going to become much more frictionless. Okay? So we're removing those barriers from, from commerce. And the second theme is that we're going to see at the action stage a, a narrowing. So if you think about the amount of choice that you're currently presented with, if you go to a supermarket, the choice is mind-bending. There's actually too much to choose from. So we're going to see that narrowed. We're going to see the toy choice tailored in that it becomes personal to you, so reflecting your particular needs. Um, and then eventually we're going to see that choice removed. And that's when machines fully take over the buying from, 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 from humans. That's going to happen at the action stage. And it probably won't surprise you for me to tell you that what's going to drive this is, of course, data. Everyone's talking about data. Data is really going to feed these themes. And it probably also won't surprise you if I tell you that we're really, really bad at using data. We're terrible at using data. So a study by the IDC, which is the International Data Corporation, um, found that of the 2.8 trillion gigabytes of data that have been created since 2012, only 0.5% of that data was actually being used. So we're really, really, we've got all this data and we keep on saying words like big data, um, but, but we're really, really bad at using it, right? And I think that this is summed up perfectly by this quote from the behavioral economist, Dan Ariely, who says, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody re really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they are doing it. And that sort of feels like where we are with data at the moment. We're teenagers in the world, world of data. We talk about it a lot. Every meeting I go into, someone says the word big data or we need a data strategy. I don't really think anyone knows what they're talking about at the moment. And I think there's a reason for that. And that's because data was never meant for people. We were never meant to be the people that processed the data and utilized it. Data was always, always going to be the food for machine learning. So machine learning, a form of artificial intelligence that uses data as an input and, and learns, adapts itself based on its inputs from data. And, and that's really the food. That's really where data is going to become super, super useful for us. So we have a big theme, which is humanity and technology merging. They're going to become one, literally and symbolically become one. We've said it's going to have a really big impact on consumer journeys in the short term. And the way in which it's going to have an impact is a closing between the triggering of the need and the action. So commerce is going to get much more frictionless and it's going to impact the way we choose. So choice is going to get narrowed, it's going to get tailored, and then it's going to get eventually removed. And the way in which this is going to be driven is by, by data, data and machine learning. Okay, so what I'm going to now talk through is some areas that we need to watch. And I want to make this as tangible and as real as, as possible, otherwise it's just, just words. But when I'm, as I st started the presentation, the way in which we predict the future is to, to look at some of the fragments of change, some of the indicators of change. And these nine areas are t nine really, really strong indicators of what is going to come next and what that will look like specifically. The idea is for this to make you feel quite uncomfortable. 
and that's, that's the point of it. And hopefully some of you are feeling uncomfortable now and, and hopefully you'll feel a bit more uncomfortable um, when I'm done with the presentation because that's what makes it so exciting because it starts to outline what the opportunity and what the ch opportunity and change is going to look like. So I'm just going to walk through these nine areas now. Um, so the first area is bots or bot life. So I think most of you guys, you're all sophisticated marketers. I spent the last two days in a room judging some of the awards at Red Apple and just incredible, particularly in digital, incredibly high caliber of work. Really, really impressive. Um, and I saw a lot of bot-based entries. So I'm assuming most of you guys know what bots are, have used bots. Probably most of you have even started developing bots, right? So bots at the moment are quite narrow experiences, yeah? They exist in messenger-based platforms, um, but not much else. And what we're gonna see with bots is that they are going to jump out of the kind of siloed messenger environments like Facebook messenger environments and embed themselves across the web, across apps, across out-of-home experiences as a ubiquitous cognitive layer, right? So they're just going to add intelligence where there was no intelligence before. And what these are going to do first and foremost is, is start to link to payment in a much more seamless way. Yeah, so going back to that notion of frictionless, frictionless commerce, closing the gap between consumer need and consume, consumer actions. They're going to do that very seamlessly. And they're also going to develop much more sophisticated natural language understanding. So you're going to be able to talk to them in a much freer way. Um, I want to show you an example now. Um, and this is the first of actually quite a few examples that came out of Google's I.O. conference, which was back in July of this year. Um, and this outlines how they see bots and how they see frictionless commerce um, developing for, for Google. Hi, how can I help? I'd like delivery from Panera. Hi, this is Panera. I'll need your delivery address. Which one can I get from Google? We'll go with 1600 Amphitheater. What can I get you started with? Uh, the strawberry poppy seed salad with steak instead of chicken. Got it. How about one of these cold drinks? And here I can just swipe through my options, see what looks good. Agave lemonade. Great. Are you ready to check out? Yep. Okay. The total is $18.40. Are you ready to place the order? Yes. I'll just scan my fingerprint to pay with Google. And that's it. So you guys can see how easy they're making it, how easy commerce becomes when you start to use bot-based functionality um, like that. So Google are, are, are really, um, really driving this. And it starts to ask new questions of, of branding, actually. Uh, questions like, if I'm going to be talking to a bot, what do my principles of conversation design look like? How does my brand come through? when I'm talking to someone in this environment. And that's something that doesn't really exist within branding at the moment. We're good at doing social, but this is the next wave of social. So that's bots and bot life. Um, the next area, the second area, is what we call messenger concierge. So if, if bots are what exists at the stage of the consumer journey where people are about to purchase, messenger concierges are a few steps back. And this is when people are in more of a conversational type of mode. So you might be talking to your friends on WhatsApp or, or MSN Messenger. And what Messenger Concierge will do is just sit in the background, listening to your conversation, processing everything that you're saying. And that probably sounds quite weird. Why on earth would I want to let something sit in the background and listen to everything I'm saying to my friends? But we'll allow this to happen because it is going to start offering up genuine utility and, and general usefulness in, in, in conversations. And it will start to aug augment conversations with uh, useful things like, for example, if I was talking to my friend and I said, hey, why don't you come over for a beer tonight? Maybe we can get some pizza. The Domino's bot can jump into that conversation and start saying, hey, we've got these pizzas on offer. I know you like them. And here's, here's a way of buying them. Or, as has already been trialed in the US by the flower delivery company 1-800-Flowers, adding flower buying options to conversations where the word flower starts to come in. So I could say to my brother, hey, it's Mother's Day next Friday. Um, maybe we should think about getting her some flowers. And this bot in the background, this messenger concierge, will listen to that conversation and jump in at the opportune moment and give you the utility that you need to buy some flowers. So it's quite smart. Um, we are seeing Facebook leading the charge in this. And they have two products already which are starting to move in this direction. So they have 
are on the one side chat extensions which, which already exist, they're already in, in, in Facebook Messenger at the moment, and effectively what these are, are um, back running app layers that sit behind your conversation and, and when you need to pull them up, you, you pull them up manually. So for example, if I wanted to uh, offer up a recipe to my conversations when I'm talking about food with some friends, I could bring up the Food Network app here and use that to inject some recipe content into the conversation. But I have to do it all by hand, it's completely manual. They've also got what's called M suggestions, and this is a really basic form of messenger concierge. And it does things like now, right now, as you probably experience in your, in your own behavior, like uh, start to try and link to diary. If you say, I'm gonna meet my friend at 3 p.m., it says, shall I add this to your calendar? Really simple things like that. What Facebook are about to do in the next couple of months is bring these two things together. And that's where messenger concierges start to get really quite sophisticated when you can use the, 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 the technology that surfaces the right things from in, into the conversations, but link it to this huge library of, of back running apps, yeah? So that's where it starts to get super sophisticated. So that's the second area, and they're both quite primitive forms of, of artificial intelligence. The third area is, is where artificial intelligence gets a, a bit more personal. So this is what we're calling next generation VPAs, or next generation virtual personal assistants. Um, so to most of us, this will be things like uh, Microsoft's Cortana, or Apple's Siri, or, or Google's Assistant, the things that we carry around with us in our pockets all, all the time. Um, and these are going to get much, much smarter. They're pretty basic at the moment, and they're going to get smarter with their, their true natural language accuracy. So this is their ability to converse with you. So Siri at the moment is at about 93 to maybe 95% accuracy. What's going to happen is it's going to get up to about 98 plus percent accuracy. But every percentage point is going to feel like a huge, huge leap in how human-like this technology feels like. Because if you bear in mind that 100% will feel like talking to a real human, when we get to 98%, it's going to feel pretty lifelike, pretty lifelike and, and, and pretty real. We're also going to see the back-end platforms opened up to developers, so developers will be able to in inject their own SDKs and, and, and content uh, into, into these VPAs. But I think the most interesting area is in what's called organic personality development. And this is where the, the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms fed by all of that data, um, start to use that data to understand you better and start to become quite empathetic. Yeah, so start to really understand who you are as a person. So for example, um, I don't wake up till I've had a coffee at about nine o'clock and I don't want to talk to anyone until I've, ha I've had my morning coffee. And these machines will be quite sensitive to that and they won't be giving me prompts or notifications until it, they know that I've woken up, I've had my, my, my morning coffee. They'll be quite ambient up until that point. Um, and there's a technology on the market at the moment, this is, this is already out, we have one at PhD, um, called Ollie. And, and Ollie is this, this lovely little robot here, really simple, sleek design. Um, and, and Ollie empathizes with you. It, it, it starts to understand what your needs are through, at the moment, very, very basic signals. Uh, but then it tailors its behavior to you based on that because it's learning. Every time it interacts with you, it's learning. And that's the value of having all of this data feeding a machine learning, learning algorithm. The fourth area is Ambient AI. So if we think about the three areas of AI that we've talked about so far, ambient AI is when AI kind of jumps out of our smartphones, which is really where the three previous areas lived, um, and starts to just embed itself everywhere in the world. And the effect this is going to have is making ordinary things intelligent. Ordinary household objects are going to start to get connectivity, but they're also going to start to get very basic forms of intelligence. So this might be along the lines of your car starting to converse with you through organic personality development. Even simple things like your toaster taking a, on, on a basic form of, or, of intelligence or your washing machine. So you could, and this is being developed at the moment, have a washing machine where you've run out of washing tablets and you just say to your washing machine, can you reorder some washing tablets? Can you put that back on my shopping list? And that's a really, really simple, basic first iteration of it. But they're going to get much, much more, more complex than that. The, the opportunity here, and this is why companies are really starting to invest in it, I'm sure 
you've all got Amazon Alexas, um, is, is spontaneous retail, right? So it's turning uh, objects into sales channels where there weren't sales channels before. If I can say to my washing machine, reorder washing powder, that's a buying opportunity that, that didn't exist before. There's a real, always, always a real commercial imperative behind it. So it creates a new gateway to sales. And again, let's have a look at some of the guys at Google are planning to do in this space. We think the assistant should be available on all kinds of devices where people might want to ask for help. The new Google Assistant SDK allows any device manufacturer to easily build the Google Assistant into whatever they're building. Speakers, toys, drink mixing robots, whatever crazy device all of you think up, now can incorporate the Google Assistant. Now we're working with many of the world's best consumer brands and their suppliers. So keep an eye out for the badge that says Google Assistant built in when you do your holiday shopping this year. So they want to put it everywhere. You know, Google's ambition is to embed themselves into every object in the world. You know, they want to become the owners of those new gateways to sales, which I think is quite a big ambition and quite a paradigm shifting am ambition. So from, from talking about AI to now talking about wearables, and I noticed kind of walking around earlier that a, a few of you have got iWatches or, or other smart watches. Um, so wearables have really started to take off in the last year, year and a half or so. But they've been quite primitive. And what we're going to see with wearables is the technology really start to evolve. Um, and wearables starting to stand alone, so stand by themselves. So if you look at the first wave of iWatches, they had to be tethered to smartphones, right? So they were effectively just a second screen for your smartphone. You couldn't use it if your iPhone was, was elsewhere. The next wave are, are completely freestanding, so they don't need to be tethered to a phone, so they can operate in, independently. But they're starting to get this really cool piece of technology built into them called deep view technology, right? And what this technology does is peer into your bloodstream. So there's a big trend in health wearables like Garmin and Fitbit and so on and so forth. The, the next wave of those is going to be enabled by this technology because what it can do is look into your bloodstream and start to analyze things like your glucose levels, your blood sugar levels, or your hydration levels. And then start to offer you up recommendations on how you should behave better to, to work with that. It's pretty impressive. So there's been a lot of talk about smart watches so far, but we, our big prediction is that smart watches won't be the future of wearable technologies. The future of wearable technologies will in fact be smart rings. Um, so smart rings like, like this, this is currently on the, on the market at, at the moment. And they'll do simple things like unlock your phone, pretty, pretty basic. They'll be able to process all of that bio data through deep view technology I just mentioned. You might get notifications through little screens on them. You might be able to gesture control things. So some of the, the, uh, the smart ring prototypes allow you to write, which is, which is quite cool. You might get alerts and so on and so forth. But the, the, the big use of this is, is going to be when they get uh, microphones built into them. Because if you think about how you use your smartphone and how you connect with your virtual personal assistant, you have to speak into it like that. It's quite open. No one really wants to do that in public. It's not a particular, particularly human behavior. But smart, what, smart rings, when they get microphones built into them, will allow you to talk like that. So you can have much more private one-to-one -one conversations with your VPA in public. And that, I think, is going to be a really, really big thing. Um, and the, expect a few of these to hit the market in the next two or three months. There were five or six really impressive iterations of this at CES uh, back in January. So from wearables to hearables, okay? So hearables, has anyone seen the film Her? So we were talking about it over dinner. So this, this is gonna, so you have, so this is very, very similar to what, what we saw in the, in the film Her, which is basically an audio input that you carry with you at all times um, that it effectively acts as the channel for your VPA. And the reason hearables are gonna take off is quite simple. The web computers have existed historically through what's called the GUI, the graphical user interface. So the first wave of computers had screens, point and click, the next wave, touch screens, swipe, et cetera, et cetera. What this has resulted in is societal screen fatigue. We spend so much time looking at screens. I mean, some days I spend 14 hours looking at a screen and my, my eyes are burning from it. I can't sleep because of the rays going into them. And, and, and that is not good. That's not good for society. You've got, you know, I think on average in developed countries, 
uh, upwards of eight hours a day spent in front of a screen. That's not not good. So the, so the reaction to that is moving away from screen-based interfaces to moving to audio interfaces as a way of connecting to, to the web. Um, and this is really where hearables are, are going to take off. And there have been some interesting movements in this space. So Google have just released a pair of headphones um, that you can put in, and they live translate for you. So I can uh, go and speak to someone of your native dialect of, of, of Russian, speak to him in English, it will translate it live into Russian and, 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 and vice versa. That's, that's already on the market. It's quite, quite impressive. But I think the, the big shift in technology is um, bone input, which is what we see over here. Now this works by having a, a, a smartwatch type technology. And as you'll see, the, the smartwatch type technology sends vibrations through the bones in your hand and fingers and you place your fingers just there behind your ears and that turns into audio because there's a bone behind your ear which turns vibrations into, into audio. Obviously that's how, how, the, how the ear works. And, and, and the benefits of that are you've always got an audio input so you can just put your, your fingers to your ear. You don't need to wear a headset or headphones. Just put your fingers to your ear and, and hear audio. Um, and you don't close off the ear, right? So you've got your fingers there, but your ear canal still stays open. Um, so you're able to listen to everything that's going around you. You're not blocked off from the world like you have uh, when you're wearing headphones. So that's pretty cool. If you think about what that might mean, so crudely, if we're walking past a shop, we can stand outside the shop, put our fingers to our ear, hear some discounts, pretty basic. But imagine if you go to the Tretiakov Gallery, which I'm going to try and go to tomorrow, and you walk up to paintings and you put your fingers behind your ear and you hear some rich information about the history of Russian art. That's quite powerful and I think that's a, that's a, that's a new layer of experience that's going to emerge around the world. And this theme of layers is, is going to continue. There are just going to be more digital layers that start to emerge, right? And these digital layers will become closer and closer and closer and closer to us. So that's the, what the theme of merge is all about. Um, and we're going to see layers beyond audio. We're going to see layers appear on video and camera-based content. So intelligent layers is the, set, is the seventh team. And these intelligent layers that exist over camera-based content and video-based content are going to be able to identify sophisticated moving objects and start to augment those objects with information. So let me give you an example of that. Google just bought a company called LipSync. Um, and what LipSync can do using this intelligent layer technology is lip read video. So you can, you can overlay it on a, on a piece of video and it, without even listening to the audio, it can lip read the video to about 75 to 80% accuracy, which is, which is just incredible that a machine layer can, can do that. Um, and it's going to change the way that we use our cameras, our smartphones and our, and our smart glasses because now we'll just be able to point our cameras at things and get very, very detailed information about, about those things. Um, so again, I'm going to show you an example of, of what Google are trying to do with this because they're really, really leading the game um, in this space. So for example, if you run into something and you want to know what it is, say a flower, you can invoke Google Lens from your assistant, point your phone at it, and we can tell you what flower it is. It's great for someone like me with allergies. <laughs> or if you've ever been at a friend's place and you've crawled under a desk just to get the username and password from a Wi-Fi router, you can point your phone at it. <laughs> and we can automatically do the hard work for you. Or if you're walking in a street downtown and you see a set of restaurants across you, you can point your phone because we know where you are, and we have our knowledge graph, and we know what you're looking at, we can give you the right information in a meaningful way. Pretty impressive, right? And it starts to turn everything into an object that can deliver you back digital information. So that, these are the new lenses that we're going to look at, look at the world through. And I love, love that Wi-Fi example. Now, if you think about Google, the core of their business has always been search, right? And this starts to redefine what we mean by search because it's not just putting text into a box anymore. It's pointing your phone at something to get the in information back. So they're expanding the utility of all of that information, the knowledge graph, as they call it. They're expanding the utility of that through these camera-based layers. It's very smart. They're also developing something quite interesting that exists near point of sale, so in, in stores. And, it, and it's a bit like GPS, but it works in a slightly different way. They call it VPS, a visual positioning system. I'm just going to show you another video of that because this is super interesting as well. It's kind of like GPS, 
But instead of talking to satellites to figure out where it is, your phone looks for distinct visual features in the environment and it triangulates with those. So you have GPS, we call this VPS, Google's Visual Positioning Service. And we think it's gonna be incredibly useful in a whole bunch of places. For example, imagine you're at Lowe's, a home improvement store that has basically everything. And if you've been there, you know it's really big. And we've all had that moment when you're struggling to find that one weird random screwdriver thing. Well, imagine in the future, your phone could just take you to that exact screwdriver and point it out to you on the shelf. Turns out we can do this with VPS. And let me show you how. And this is working today. So here we are walking down an aisle at Lowe's and the phone will find these key visual feature points which you can see there in yellow. And by comparing the feature points against previously observed ones, those colorful dots in the back, the phone can figure out exactly where it is in space down to within a few centimeters. So GPS can get you to the door and then VPS can get you to the exact item that you're looking for. So Google are basically out to map everything in, in the world. And you know, you think about how we are now using marketing near, near point of sale. So it's very, very basic, kind of GPS targeted. You know, this is the next wave of directing consumers to the, 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 the products that they need. Um, so that's, that's intelligent layers. The eighth area is um, where we really start to think about mixed reality. Um, so you would have seen all of these layers that are, that are kind of appearing around the world. And we're not going to be walking around looking at these layers the whole time through our smartphones. What is likely going to happen is we're going to see a next wave of smart glasses come to the market. Now, we've had some failed attempts at smart glasses so far. So Google released Google Glass, which I'm sure you all know about, which I think was more of a PR stunt than an actual product. It didn't go so well. Uh, Microsoft have HoloLens, which looks super interesting if you look at the beta tests, but it's so, so, so far away from being consumer ready. Um, we're going to see a, a, a new wave of these hit, hit the market pretty soon. Um, and the most interesting company in mixed reality at the moment is a company called Magic Leap. And Magic Leap are super, super secretive. It's really difficult to find information on, on what, they, what they're doing, but they've got some huge uh, venture capital funds uh, behind them. Um, so this is a picture of their founder, Roni Abovitz, um, and he's holding up their product, um, which they call the chip, uh, but it's actually a lens. And this thing is so, so interesting. So this chip uh, on it has these tiny nano ridges. So these are sub subatomic ridges. And on the outside of it, it has these tiny Pico projectors. And these Pico projectors shoot photons into the, into the, uh, into the chip. And the nano ridges filter away the photons in such a way that when they get to your eye, an image is formed, right? So you've, you've got essentially a way of projecting imagery onto the eyeball from, from such a close distance. And a PhD, when we, were, when we were doing a lot of work and researching this, we worked with Kevin Kelly, who's the, one of the founding editors of Wired magazine, famous, famous um, US tech, tech magazine. And he's spent a bit of time with uh, Roni out, out in Silicon Valley, and he's, he's tried on the, the alpha version of this product. And it wasn't as elegant as a, as a little lens like that. It, of course, was a you know, big headset with wires coming out and all of that sort of stuff. But he said he, he put it on, and in front of him appeared this brushed bronze statue. He said it was about that big. And he said he walked up to it and got so close to it. And he said you could see the brush strokes, the, the, the definition was, was that fine. And he had to take it on and off to make sure that they weren't trying to trick him and someone hadn't wheeled out a real bronze statue and was wheeling it away every time he took it off. He said it was, he said it was that well defined. Um, and, and this is going to be quite, quite profound. This, this, for me, is really where the big paradigm shift happens when we're walking around with these things on. If you think about what this might mean, if we think about the weather, for example, we might just be able to look up at the clouds and see the weather systems augmented on, on the clouds in, in real time. But also, if you think about what this means for media, so media now is screen-based, TVs, tablets, smartphones. This technology will be able to turn any flat surface, or in fact anything, into, into media. So if you think about what that means for, let's take an example of cinema. Okay, cinema, big flat screen. Maybe cinema will look something like this in, in, in the future. So that's, that's come from Magic Leap. That's their ambition for this product. 
people collectively getting together, wearing these we, these glasses, having these in, incredible collective experiences, um, and that's pretty impressive. So the final area, and I think this is probably the area furthest away from where we are at the moment, is the the virtual reality web. So everyone's familiar with VR, right? Everyone knows knows VR. VR has kind of taken off in some areas. It's really, really big in the gaming community, and I can kind of understand why it's big in the gaming community. Um, but it's quite a lonely experience. When you, when you put on a set of VR goggles, you, you're on your own, you're in this virtual world, but you're by yourself. And of course, we're fundamentally quite social creatures, we crave social experiences. So it stands that at some point we need to make VR social. The problem with making VR social at the moment is that it's really, really difficult to do. Um, and that's because it takes so much processing power to render these virtual worlds in a way that multiple people can enter them. Just the graphics required to do that um, are so, so uh, resource consuming. But there is one company, uh, it's a British company, um, called Improbable, who are, who are trying to do this. Um, I'm just going to play a video of their, their CEO talking about his ambitions for the company and, and where he wants to take the company. Today I want to talk about what could be the next big frontier in computing. We want to make possible massive simulated worlds that can help us look at this world differently. So why not represent entire cities in simulations or represent a whole company or an economy? What could we learn about those systems by having that model? Take, for example, the possible impact of shutting down a tube station on a city. Without a simulation, we could guess at what that would be, but with a simulation, we could actually run that experiment. We could take a model of a city, we could shut down that tube station, and we could see how does it impact where people can get to? How does it impact commercial activity? What is the actual cost of it? Those are the sorts of models that would be very hard to build today, but developers can use Spatial OS to make that a reality. Today games are an illusion of being in a world. As you walk around the world, the world only exists when you're there. When you build a world on Spatial OS, it's a persistent universe where every entity exists even when you're not around. But with Worlds Adrift in Bosses Studios, we see a world where every tree you cut down or every rock you blow up becomes something that other players can encounter. Every decision you make means something and matters. I hope that the projects people are going to build on Spatial OS will excite people in a way that they had always been expecting to be wowed and, and, and to see wonder. We've always been waiting for the promise of virtual worlds. There's so many fields that would benefit from being able to do really big models, um, and that, to me, like, is the next frontier. So I think that you know we might be the first people doing this, but we definitely won't be the last. So he's, he's almost trying to be able to build version one of the Matrix, a, a parallel world that exists digitally through through virtual reality. It's quite profound. And there are lots of things that need to happen to make this a, a reality. Um, and there need to be some quite big leaps, in particular in the way that we render humans in this environment. Um, and if you look at this example, I find this quite unnerving, but this is how real face rendering is starting to become with some of the graphical capabilities we, we now have. I don't understand. Yes. No. No. Maybe. Goodbye. Willkommen in Deutschland. How can I help you? So that's from a company called Animate Technology who specialize in, in speech rendering through virtual avatars like that. So it's super, super realistic. Um, and this last example I'm going to show you is probably the weirdest example of, of, of all of them. And it makes me feel a bit queasy, actually. It makes me feel quite, quite uneasy. But this is what happens when you take technology like this that, that sort of renders humans in a human-like way and you add artificial intelligence to it. So here's Baby X, and this is, um, she's been learning to read words. So here's her first word book. So let's see what she can see. It's into a page. And here we go, let's see what she, what's this, baby? What's this, what's this, what's this? Good girl, now see if she knows what the word is. Okay, baby, look over here. Okay, what's this, what's this? So that's, that wasn't programs, the, the, the baby's learning with the human. So it's learned what a sheep is, and it will continue to learn through machine, machine learning. That, that's the beauty of it. I, I find that quite worrying personally, but you know, that's just me. Um, 
So look, those are the nine areas, the nine fragments that we feel are good indicators of what, what the change looked like. Um, and there's probably some of you in the room thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? Why have you even come here? What, what, what is this? Um, but I hope there's more of you thinking, that's really interesting, but what the hell do I do now? What's next? What, as a marketer or, an, or as an agency person or as a creative, do I need to do to capitalize on this change and start to plan for this change before it occurs? Um, and quite simply, just to close up, there are five things you can do right now that will prepare you for this world that is driven by humanity and technology coming together, merging and become one. Quite simply, the first one is you can think about how you build out your uh, ad and marketing technology strategy. So building out your tech stacks. I think lots of people are doing that at, at, at the moment. The second area, which I feel some people are moving into, but certainly there needs to be a much more pronounced shift into this, is investing in knowledge management. So going back to that point around bot layers, thinking about how you can make all the information that exists within your business that might be quite siloed, accessible through, through AI and to people. Um, third area is thinking about how we start to build uh, integration into virtual personal assistants and, and ambient AIs. So how can you make your business AI deliverable when AI starts to power absolutely everything. So which are the first brands that are going to make themselves available in AI powered washing machines, for, for example. Um, fourth area is, is think about who you partner with, right? So, you know, as, as agency people, marketers, a, a lot of these new disciplines are outside of our core set of capabilities. So we need to be forming more alliances, more partnerships, and thinking about who is driving the big shifts here? Who are we going to work with that can help us do this better? Um, you probably saw Google four or five times in that. They're definitely a good group of people to start talking to. And then the fifth, final, furthest away is start to think about how we can prepare ourselves for a virtual reality and a mixed reality world. Um, conveniently, we've written a book about this. It's called Merge. It goes into these areas in much, much more detail. Um, it's got lots of interviews with key technology people in there like Kevin Kelly, like Ray Kurzweil, who we co-authored the, the, the book with. So if you do want to find out more, please pick up the book. It's available on Amazon. All the profits go to charity. They go to UNICEF. They're not for us. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Ah, okay. Okay, great, clear. Um, so I think if we look at the, um, the way in which uh, developing markets have adopted new technologies, um, what they've done is leapfrogged some, some developed markets. So I, uh, one example I'd use would be um, Africa. So Africa have never had a, um, a physical um, web network, so it's very difficult to put um, you know, the pipes, the cables required into the ground to, to deliver people internet connections. So they never had desktop computers like, they, like we did. But their mobile behavior is far more complex than, than most Western markets. In Kenya, a quarter of their gross domestic product, their GDP, goes through mobile payments, right? Which is, which is, a, which is a huge amount. So I think what, what we're going to see is not developing markets left behind, they'll probably just jump in at a high stage of development but not go through all of the stages that we would go through to, to get to there. And if there's one trend that kind of works with that uh, trend of uh, a kind of exponential progress of technologies, it's a trend called Moore's Law, which says that as technology um, doubles in its capacity, its, its speed, its cost will also halve. So whilst technology is getting faster, it's also getting cheaper. So technology will become much, much more accessible, much, much more accessible. If you think how much a computer cost in 1970 uh, and how much a smartphone costs today, a smartphone is 10,000 times more powerful than, than that, that computer. So I think access is, is going to be a factor that just becomes much greater. Thank you very much. Привет. Меня зовут Саша, я по-английски не говорю. Простите. Да не знаю. В общем, такой вопрос. Меня заинтересовал восьмой пункт. И ребята, которые хотят быть новыми 
IBM. Вот. Возможно ли, что в будущем это моделирование дойдет до такой mm -hmm. степени, что мы сможем в открытом доступе видеть... Что будет происходить, если, например, Северная Корея решит запустить очередную ракету? И как будут реагировать другие страны? И что, например, через три года это приведет к каким-то последствиям? Или мы выбираем такого-то кандидата в президенты? Ну и так далее, так далее. Это реально вообще? И мы можем это Окей, lots and lots of different variables and use machine learning to crunch them to start to make, make predictions. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever get to the stage where we'll be able to use uh, models like that to, to predict the future because w w once you predict the future, um, the future has the potential to change. Right? There are so many variables that, that, that impact it. So I think that might be maybe something that stays in sci-fi movies and doesn't come to life in, in, in reality. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you guys were freaking out about the baby that you showed us. For me, uh, even the messenger concierge is creepy. <laughs> and my question is, um, when we integrate, uh, integrate our brand in all this uh, technology, uh, how do we not scare the consumer? Like, how do we keep the balance? Because they can mm. be disturbed. Mm. Mm. It's, um, the, the balance is found in its, in its utility. Um, so consumers will allow this to happen and are allowing this to happen because it's useful. It's, it's making their lives easy. The second we cross that boundary and, and ask for more is, is when we'll start to be re rejected. And I think there is, you know, there's potentially something big on the horizon uh, around data. And I think certainly big companies like Google and Facebook need to offer up a much greater transparency around what they are collecting from people. Um, and how they are making money from people. Because, you know, remember, Facebook don't own any content, they don't produce any content, Google don't produce, produce any content, we produce the content for them. They then monetize that content, that's how their business model works. And I think for this future to exist seamlessly, we need a much greater transparency from those companies on, on what we're giving them and what they get back from that. Да, можно? Last questions. По-русски я спрошу, вам переведут. Может ли в ближайшее время искусственный интеллект занять, заняться творчеством, писать книги, музыку, рисовать и придумывать юмор? Yeah. Yeah. И будет ли это конкурентоспособно? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, there, are, there are some really interesting examples of um, AI-based creativity. Um, it's very, very simple at the moment. Um, but what AI is, is brilliant at doing, and this is really where I see the, the future relationship between AI and creativity, is, is complementing humans. Um, AI would make the most incredible creative partner. Um, and the, the way I've always looked at this, and a way a friend is, is, is describes it to me, is creativity is combinations of things. So he says that nothing original ever exists. Um, everything is a combination of something else. And what AI is brilliant at doing is combining things really, really quickly at, at a rate no human could ever, 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 ever combine things. And the interesting uses of AI I've seen so far in the creative space are when really the AI, AI creates a load of creative options, and then the human in position on that is working out which of those options is the best, playing with it, tweaking it. So I see a, a partnership between, between humans and, and AIs to get to, to, get to greater creativity. Um, but I'm not sure they'll ever get to writing a great novel, <laughs> to answer your question. Добрый день, спасибо за презентацию. Меня зовут Мила. Я, к сожалению, плохо говорю по-английски, поэтому даже не буду пытаться. А у меня два вопроса. По вашим оценкам, сколько вот эти изменения займут времени? То есть вы ничего не сказали про время. То есть как вы оцениваете, сколько пройдет времени от, скажем, первой части до девятой? 
И второй вопрос. Мы все идем к тому, что у нас практически не остается свободы выбора. То есть за нас решают нашим, нас ведут к решениям машины, и в будущем это будет еще более узко. Не остается ли вот этого вот страха, что не будет свободы выбора, что мы будем в какой-то игре, куда нас, нас будут как овечек вести в одну сторону? И не будет ли этот страх как-то мешать развитию? Got it, got it. Um, okay, so to, to answer your first question uh, around time frames, um, the, the, the book goes into a lot of detail around the, the different stages of, of this happening. So the nine areas I talked about, um, some of them are starting to happen now, but the time frame is between now and about 2025 that we'll start to see all, all of those things happen. After 2025 is where things start to get much, much more interesting. Um, and that's really where you start to see humans merge with, with technology. I think your second question is a, is a really, really good question. Um, that that, that re re really is. Um, are we giving away too much to, to, to machines? Um, have we surrendered ourselves to machines? And that's a really interesting philosophical and moral debate um, about the role of technology in, in humanity at the moment. I think for the examples that I talked through earlier, um, we are surrendering decisions that we don't want to make. And that, that's, that's, the, that's the difference here. So you will see low involvement categories like fast moving consumer goods, or you're buying washing powder, or you're buying mayonnaise, things that you don't really want to think about. You will see machines doing that for us in a better way and we'll be happy with that because it saves us time and that's a, that's a better use of the time. You, you're never going to get a machine buying you a Mulberry handbag or a Gucci watch. Those are the type of decisions that we enjoy making and you know, it's what we call shopping. Um, I don't think that will ever, ever go away. I think there will always be a role for that, that human decision making in high involvement and high enjoyment categories. It's, it's, the, it's the bottom end, it's buying soap that we just don't want to think about, we'll just let the machine get, get on with it. So I think you, you have a blend between some human decisions retained and some boring decisions automated by, by machines. Спасибо. Добрый день. Я тоже задам вопрос на русском. На данный момент все наши гаджеты, часы, телефоны и так далее являются средством, которые должны улучшать нашу жизнь, помогать нам добиваться больших успехов в спорте, в фитнесе, делать наш, наш образ жизни более здоровым. Но с развитием технологий, с развитием виртуальной среды, это не произойдет ли ситуации, что люди, поскольку они такие иррациональные и очень стремятся как можно проще, как сказать, к простой жизни, что они выберут более простую и дешевую способу, способ находиться в виртуальном мире, и это повлечет как раз таки обратный эффект и произойдет некую деградацию в в качестве здоровья, в качестве общества. Аналог фильма «Сурогаты» может быть. Да, да. Это очень хороший вопрос. Так что есть всегда потенциал для этого. И есть много интересных литературы в данный момент о моделинге, что будущие сценарии выглядят. И есть некоторые сценарии, которые говорят exactly об этом. Мы становимся слишком зависимыми от технологий, и мы забываем управлять человечеством. Um, I, I personally don't believe that that will, that will be the case. Um, I think we will, we will get to a system where we find a way to coexist with technology that empowers humanity rather than detracts from humanity. And I think if you look at what drives technological progression, it's not the desire to do more, it's the, it's the market, it's economics that, that drives it. And I think we will always be tempered by the, 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 fr the free market and that will always need some level of human control to, to, to manage it. So I don't think we'll ever uh, surrender ourselves to, to machines in such a way. I think, you know, when, when you get into that sort of world, you're, you're really into the sort of themes of some of the dystopian sci-fi that was written in the 70s and 80s. I think, honestly, the, the profit motive will stop us, stop us getting there. Exactly. Yeah, it will stop us getting there before it becomes too late. Thanks. Есть еще вопросы? 
Вопросов нет. Мы благодарим Рона за прекрасную Thank секцию, you. благодарим всех за вопросы. И те, кто задавал вопросы, предлагаем взять книгу Рона.